Forestry Minister Shane Jones is considering reining in forestry conversions after a rural backlash. He's also warned foreign-owned forestry companies, which make up nearly 75% of the industry, that unless they provide more access for local processes to get timber, they could face an oil and gas-style ban. Now, this comes from a government that's made it easier for overseas investors to buy land for forestry, but is now faced with provincial towns telling them their farm servicing centres are being hollowed out. In-depth journalist Guyon Espiner sat down with Shane Jones, who was both forestry and regional development minister, and asked him why the government wanted to sell forestry land to foreigners in the first place. If forestry is to play a bigger role for climate change, and if forestry is to play a bigger role in environmental outcomes, halting the erosion and degradation of our waterways through the loss of soil, then I I think it's just a pragmatic stance that New Zealand First, which is uh, predominantly an economic patriotic party, but we have to recognise that 75% of the forest sector is already owned internationally, and the facts of the matter are we are not massively increasing. That's what the data shows. We're not massively increasing foreign encroachment into our forestry landscape. We've actually just simplified it for the existing owners to continue to trade in and out. If 75% of the forestry industry is in foreign hands, does that mean most of the profits of this industry are, are going uh, back overseas as well? Oh yeah, I mean, if foreigners invest in our forest sector, obviously they came here in the 1990s wanting to put their money at risk and then repatriate the dividends overseas, which is why I'm saying uh, to the extent that they want to continue holding these assets in New Zealand, I look forward at the next election campaign at promoting more ideas. I only got 7% of the vote this time, so not many of those ideas enjoyed traction. But, you know, most of the... I'd say to the Kiwis that are operating on behalf of the foreigners, if you're not going to look after your neighbours, don't underestimate the capacity of governments to change the rules. Oil and gas looms large. What would you like them to do to have more skin in the game in New Zealand and put more in than they're not doing? Ideally, I'd like to see more foreign investors enjoying exposure to the whole to the whole vertical chain. Planting the trees, husbanding the trees, having interest in sawmills, having interest in processing capacity, so that the envelope goes from the stem of the tree to the quality of the board coming out of the sawmill. That is not the case at the moment. There are some signal exceptions to that. I have to acknowledge the Japanese The Japanese, I think, in many respects, have been model citizens, but they're a minority. And what about the impact on some of these small towns? I mean, they're worried, aren't they, that these service towns in the Wairarapa and other places around New Zealand are going to move to uh, a a, a sort of the hustle and bustle of a a sheep or beef farm to one where people sit around and watch trees grow for 30 years. Yeah. So there... There's a lot of myth-making and, uh, and fishtails in that regard. The reality is that uh, forestry occupies about 1.2 million hectares. I think there's 8.5 million hectares for farmland. Uh, farmland is not being conquered in any time soon, so let's deal with the facts. Secondly, the number of workers per hectare for forestry is nigh on 20 per hectare when you consider the 35,000 employees in the forest sector across only 1.2 million hectares of land. It is vastly higher than sheep and, uh, sheep and beef. It's sporadic, but look, though, isn't it? <coughs> it's sporadic, though, isn't it, Minister? I mean, you, yeah, you... So that's what I'm about to say. The reality is I'm not going to shy away from the fact that land use is in a state of transition, and that transition was happening before I became the Minister. But I'm, I'm alert to the concerns of Mayor Little in particular in Wairau. But then I say to the cockies, well, what do you want us to do? Because it's your neighbours that are selling these farms. And quite frankly, the majority of them are not being sold to foreigners. They're being sold to other Kiwis. And probably what's driving those transactions is a perception about the value of carbon uh, in, in the new um, forestry carbon industry. And uh, in that sense, that's how the system is is meant to work, but there's some big political challenges there. Well, that's right, because, I mean, you, you are providing the incentives, though. Are you saying, come on in and, mm. and, and buy this land or convert this land? Mm. Is that not why we've seen a, a jump in the value of forestry land? Because it's becoming more attractive. Yeah. 
But I just want Kiwis to bear in mind, for the last 10 years, we introduced 100,000 cows per year for 10 years. The vast majority of the land conversion has been from forestry into farming. And now we're seeing a small reversion from farming back to forestry. But stick with the facts, for the last 10 years, 100,000 cows per year. So we are, when we sh I, I don't want to shy away from it. We're in the midst of a land transition process. We are correcting uh, what I think has been a, a massive uh, gamble on farming, particularly dairy. And I think society has spoken through the election process. The trick for me is to man help manage that transition that it is not fatally disruptive. So how far do you want to go with this pendulum change? I think that, look, I've asked for some advice as to whether or not what we should be promoting is forestry in marginal precipitous country. Lord knows how you measure that. But more importantly, whether or not our focus should be on farm forestry into the future and whether that would anchor more Kiwis wanting to continue to own their land. There's one area, perversely enough, where this doesn't affect and which is why it's been a pleasure working with Māori because their land can never ever be sold and uh, short of some sort of fiscal hurricane. And they're the ones who have embraced probably the 118, uh, the, 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 very, the 240 odd million dollars Māori Dim have stepped up to the plate, including the JVs, to play a big role in forestry because they don't have the drama of having to sell their land. But my message to the farmers is that land use is in a state of transition and forestry is going to continue to um, occupy and grow in those marginal precipitous areas. And if that ends the degradation of our environment and leads to better land use outcomes over time, then farm forestry represents a recipe how they can stay on the land and profit. Do you see a conflict in tension between your role as a regional development champion mm. and a forestry minister when some of these small towns are saying, hey, you, you're killing my town? Yeah, I feel it deeply. I do. Uh, why do I feel it deeply? Just study where I came from. My dad was one of 17 children. I grew up in Awanui. I saw what happened to small rural towns in the 80s. Uh, I was on a farm with my parents when that happened. I know exactly what that feels like. If there are things that I need to do, either through mitigation, or other sorts of interventions, then I want people to know I'm up for that challenge. But I also want people to accept primary industry in New Zealand, which is, a, is largely rural industry, we are going through a reset. Whether this government is here or not, the reset is taking place before our eyes. Shane Jones speaking there to Guy on Espiner, and you can read more on the Green Rush series in the in-depth section on rnz.co.nz.